everyone this is Richard Solomon taking care of business and we have a super special ultra cool show you know um, we are at the North Shore Towers because we were at the debut uh, soiree of a movie about Gerald Salente but one of the greatest things about being on the inside of this project <laughs> is actually talking to the real Gerald Salente so first of all welcome to the show and thank you for spending some time with us oh thanks for having me Richard all right. so for the people out there that may not know you you're, you're known for trends you're you're like an extrapolator basically you know you take what is out there and you can project out and figure out what's going to happen and then people really seek out your advice on what's going to happen in the future. You know, I've been doing this since 1980 and I've never used that term extrapolator and that's the ideal term. So that's the first time I've heard that. You can use it. (laughs) I, I am and I just used it now. And that's exactly what we do. We extrapolate data. We look at life for what it is, not the way we want it to be. Current events form future trends. We're all doing in life what we're doing because of decisions we've made. Uh, that, there's no, there are no accidents. Uh, uh, yeah. There are the wild cards. Right, right. And that's why you can't predict the future. You can forecast the trends and see where they're going, but there are always those wild cards. So tracking trends is an understanding of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. So the name of your show is... Taking care of business. So in the business world, I had forecast the panic of 08. I also forecast the 1987 stock market crash. It's in the Wall Street Journal. It's everywhere. And a number of other major trends. But I got it wrong because I believed that we would not get over the panic of 08. Because, again, tracking trends is an understanding of where we are, how we got here and where we're going, and you look back, there was never a thing in the history of the world, part one or part two, of a thing called quantitative easing. What is quantitative easing? Is that a a Fed thing? It's a Fed thing. What the Fed did was they ballooned their balance sheet from about $500 billion to about $4 trillion by buying up mortgage-backed securities and bonds, unprecedented in world history. And then what they did, here we are, 90 months of 0% interest rates. Now, I just met you just a couple of (laughs) minutes ago, but it looks like you've been around a bit. And once upon a time, people used to put money in the bank, and they called it a savings account. Now, you put now it's called an erosion account. You got it. Well put. Zero percent interest rates for 90 months. And, and you know what the big insult is? For the few crumbs that you get, they tax. <laughs> yeah. And you get basically just a couple of crumbs. And exactly, you're getting nothing. So, again, going back to why you can't predict the future, you don't know what the wild cards are going to be, but you can see the trend lines. So... The economy should have stumbled. It has not recovered. The the um, I could tell you that, and I'll tell you. I don't want to interrupt. But I'll tell you. I'm an, I'm an attorney by trade, and I remember a long time ago, I used to incorporate all kinds of people. People come to me. I need a corporation. I need a corporation for this. I need a corporation for that. Maybe I would do four a month. Now I'm lucky if I do four a year. It, you truly see how flat business is because I represent small business owners and they're the bellwether of business and they're not taking chances they're not starting businesses I see now the few people that are doing something or maybe doing a a new line of a business or they're just doing an offshoot or they're getting a son or daughter kind of started in their own thing but the real creation of new business is not happening no it's not happening you have GDP growth since 2009, when they started this scam, 
at only 2.2% on average. And even that's inflated. You look at the gap between the rich and the poor, it's wider now than it was during the Gilded Age. So all of this cheap money, it's not only the United States is doing it worldwide. All it's doing is pumping up the equity markets because here's the deal. You're borrowing, you're a big corporation, you're borrowing money for nothing. And then what you do with that nothing for borrowing money is you buy back your stock. That's the biggest percentage of it next to the merger and acquisition activity. So you just mentioned people aren't starting businesses anymore because the bigger businesses are gobbling up everybody and they're monopolizing the market because they're borrowing the money for nothing. Money for nothing. (laughs) Exactly. And merging, that's what's driving the stock markets. So anyway, that's what we look at. So you get it wrong in sometimes the timing, but the outcome is the same. So that's the difficulty and the realities of trend forecasting. You hit them, you miss them. I like to take the word clean food. I coined that term, New York Times did a story of that. 1994, I actually coined it. They did a story in 96. You can see where the trends are moving. But what happens is that people have ideologies. You ask people, what are you? Well, I'm a conservative Republican. Well, good for you. I'm a... I'm a progressive democrat i'm a political atheist you want to believe in whatever political religion you want knock yourself out i'm only looking for the facts and i became a political atheist because of my career path at a graduate school i used to run political campaigns in westchester county back in the day when that was the richest county in the country and from there they sent me up to albany and i was the assistant to the secretary of the new york state's senate And at that time, that's when I really got to see things. I mean, here I am. I'm a 23-year-old kid, and I'm sitting in the in the chamber, behind the chamber in the in the Senate, you know, with the governor of New York, my boss Al Abrams, and the majority leader John Anderson. You know, I remember John Anderson. Oh yeah, yeah. in in my Robert Hall suit. You know, and uh, and then I from there I I taught American politics and campaign technology at St. John's University. Of course, I designed and instructed. And then I became a government affairs specialist for the chemical industry. And I used to live between Chicago and, um, and uh, Washington. So I got on the inside to see how things were. I have, I have photos of me and Ronald Reagan. I, hired, I actually hired him to do a gig for our group in 1976, two days before he announced he was running against Jerry Ford. And one of my chief writers in the Trends Journal is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, who was Reagan's assistant treasury secretary. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. this is a guy that could and did bring in the director of the CIA and question him under oath. That's wow. the level he's at. But like myself, we're guys that have been around, so it's all a bunch of BS to us. We can't stand <laughs> what's going on and are very saddened by the direction the country is going in terms of the loss of our constitutional rights the never-ending wars and the decline of the um, what made this country the clearly the envy of the world and the land of opportunity it's not there anymore you can see that you yeah, can I see just that. came back from just a couple of days ago I actually cut my trip short to come here I was in Italy I went to the Milano Expo and then I went down to Croatia uh, through Slovenia and all the way down to Dubrovnik and there's a lot of anti-Americanism over there. They don't, you know, they don't like what's going on. They don't like America's uh, interference all over the, all over the, uh, the world. So we're not as loved as we used to be. No, it's sad, and uh, I think the biggest problem is that nobody who's really looking at this sees a, a way up or out. Well, we do. On September 20th, we're launching Occupy Peace in Colonial Kingston, New York, at the Four Corners, that the most f- historic Four Corners in the USA. Talk about that. That's a, they, we talked about this in pre-production. This is fascinating. Well, here I am again. I'm in Dubrovnik, right? And I look over this wall, you know, this whole Walden City, and there's a building, and, and, and over the door it says 1761. And I said, you know, big deal. I have a 1750 building. <laughs> and then there's a 1763 we own and a 1774. 
and there's a museum on the other corner that's 1661. And what we're doing from this corner, thats the, I say it's the most historic corner because it's the only place in the United States where there's a pre-revolutionary war building on each corner. We're launching Occupy Peace to honor thy founding fathers, beginning with George Washington, a real warrior. This is a guy that fought, not one of these El Presidentes with an attitude that calls themselves commander-in-chief and couldn't fight the weight of a paper bag. His farewell address, no foreign entanglements. And then people say, well, it was different back then. No, it wasn't. The world was at war. The weapons are different, but the world was at war back then. Did anybody forget Napoleon's march to Russia? You know, I mean, you could go on and on. And then you go to Franklin. You go to Adams. You go to Jefferson. One after another, no foreign entanglements. So what we're doing with Occupy Peace to honor thy founding fathers is to bring home the troops, seal the borders, and rebuild America. A work projects administration program. Now, when you say we, are you an army of one? Or is there no, a- no, we're launching this Occupy Peace program. The, the website's OccupyPeace.us. Okay, and, but who, who is there going to be standing with you arm in arm? To start? Well, the people that come there. Well, right now, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, who's the okay. former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan, he'll be there, and we're bringing in other people. But we have a plan. This isn't a rally to yell and scream. What it is is that, do you know Congress has not voted to go to war since World War II? I believe that, yes. So we're going to demand that Congress votes. You know, like what's going on now in Greece? Uh, they're going to have a referendum. Right, they're going to have a referendum to see whether or not they're going to accept the bailout. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I assume that if they don't accept it, they're going to go back to the drachma? I don't know. But, but, but the point is, it's direct democracy. The people are going to decide. And let's get this straight. We don't have a representative form of government. We have a gang of 535 senators and congressmen. And they, they, I love the terminology they use. They get all this dough from these big corporations and others. They call it campaign contributions. Could anyone say bribes or payoffs? So what we're saying is, not only are we going to demand that Congress, any time we go into a foreign country, that they vote on it, but we the people in each state will have a referendum to tell our congressmen and senators how to vote. Oh, real rep- See, we have representative government now, but it's the lobbyists are representative and, and the regular people aren't, you know, <laughs> which is it's just sort of the problem, you know, which is totally the problem. But so let's, let's go back to the beginning because this is all very, very, really cool and very, very unique and very interesting radio. How does one become a trends analyst? Because I know there's no school for this. I know that there's no book. You probably created all of this. So you're the originator of the extrapolator, you know, <laughs> I'm, one of, I'm one of the originators. John Nesbeth, actually, he wrote to Megatrends. And um, I followed it up with trend tracking, which uh, Time Magazine was said was far better than Megatrends. Uh, You're right, there is no school of it for it, and it's ridiculous that there's not. You get a degree in history, but nobody gives you a degree on how to see what's going on and how to prepare for it. It's it's stupid that there isn't. And and the universities are close to it. uh, They don't even teach you how to compile and and put a a checkbook together in in high school. So, So, you know, there's a lot of things that are really overtly missing from the agenda of education that I think would be practical and hands-on. So I mentioned to you how I began my career. So I was in D.C., and the Iranian conflict broke out. I was living in D.C. at the time. So Yeah, so we may have crossed may paths. Have. Well, it was every time down there in those <laughs> days, too. Anyway, um, Jimmy Carter goes over to spend New Year's Eve with the Shah and his wife. And... I had been following what was going on, the overthrow of Mosaddegh in 1953 by the CIA and the MI6 in the UK, because Mosaddegh, democratically elected, a university professor, um, he had the nerve, remember this is 1953, to nationalize Iranian oil and saying that, no, Standard Oil, better known today as ExxonMobil, doesn't own it, and neither does Anglo-Iranian Oil, better known today as BP, own it. The people own it. Well, they couldn't have any of that, so they 
brought in the Shah, this brutal dictator. They Actually, they plucked him out of the south of France. And I've been reading about this for years. When the revolution began, and I'm seeing millions of people in the streets, I said, oh, this thing is real. This thing's not going away. Jimmy Carter comes back after spending New Year's Eve, he and Rosalind with the Shah and his wife. And in those days, it was a big deal. They were in the helicopter, you know, he'd salute. And he goes up to the microphones. And he says that the Shah is the island of stability in the Middle East. <laughs> and at that moment, I became a political atheist. You know, I'm a, born in the Bronx, and we used to say, BS has its own sound. <laughs> and I heard it loud and clear. And then after getting over the anger that he was lying to us and promoting this brutal guy that used to enslave... The, you'd read about the Savak, the secret police. It was a terrible dictatorship. Anyway, after I got over that emotion, I said, what will be the implications? And I realized that gold and oil prices would go up. And I started playing both markets, not knowing a thing. I was a kid, you know, I was like 32 years old, you know. Kid now, after I'm 68. But, you know, looking back, you know, you're growing up. I didn't know what the was are doing. I had no advice. 68's the new 48. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. It's 68. <laughs> and um, so everything skyrocketed. I was able to quit my job. And I realized that current events form future trends. But I'm watching everybody get emotionally involved in this through a political lens hearing the propaganda that's being pushed out, which I now call by the prostitutes, because that's all it's become. And I started doing it in field after field after field. And then in, 19, so I just started in 1980, and then in 1987, I sent out a press release. 1987, the year it will all end and the stock market will collapse. And that was the beginning. So the crash of 87 happened. I got recognition for it. And then what I also do different than other trend forecasts is, is we cover over 300 different trend categories. All things are connected, or as Chief Seattle is alleged to have said, all things are connected like the blood which unites us all. So when you're looking at something economically, you have to look at the social, political, environmental. You have to keep looking at all the different spectrums that are connected. And so that's what we do differently. All right, this is Richard Solomon. I am with Gerald Salenti. We'll be right back. All right, Richard Solomon with Extrapolator. <laughs> Gerald, Gerald Salente, who I am honored to be here with. And, and we should probably thank... Um, Liz Libertori, uh, who's a relative of yours cousin, and a friend yeah, of mine. Yeah, she's great. Oh, boy, what a doer she, she is. It's, and what all, a, it's all about networking. See, I guess my only claim to fame is I'm a, a fairly okay networker. Um, actually, nobody's, nobody networks like she does, but at least if you know the people to network with, that gets you people like Gerald Slenty you know, in a one-on-one -on -one, you know, intimate interview. All right, so... You were talking a little bit about your career, and you predicted the crash of 87. And that was a brutal crash, because I graduated from law school in 85. And I remember what the legal market was like, because the legal market suffered immeasurably, and people were not getting jobs, and firms weren't hiring, and it was a, it was a morass out there. It was terrible. So, and that wasn't, it wasn't that long ago, and I still don't know that we ever really recovered from it in a real sense. Well, Richard, let me cut you off right there, or interject, rather. You're 100% right, because that's when Alan Greenspan came in and started this whole thing of cheap money. That was the beginning of it, and the Federal Reserve has never stopped it. Alan Greenspan... I guess it's... Green scam. Green scam. It's perfect. <laughs> he just did, it was coined here, people. <laughs> it was coined here. See, Freud would be like, yep, that's right. <laughs> And, and it really, so you're right. We really, it was a false everything. You know, people go back and they say, you know, the 90s, you know, Clinton takes credit for it. Again, I got that one wrong. Because I underestimated the potential of, and you have a lot of knowledge in the field, of the Internet revolution. It only really began in 1994. 
When Al Gore invented it. When Al Gore invented it. <laughs> I forgot. That's right. And and that's what boosted the 90s. It was another bubble. And it was real, too. But the real economy never recovered. It's only been juiced. So that's... And then I then I saw the Asian currency crisis in the in the late '90s as well. I could see that one happening. You know, you look what's going on as we're speaking. This last week and a half, the Shanghai index in China has lost nearly twenty percent in a week and a half. Wow, yeah. that, that is a staggering that's, number. That, that's a bear market by all definitions, and. People don't know this is going on because the quantitative easing that I mentioned, they got another name for it over there in Japan. They call it Abenomics. <laughs> you know, same same game. Yeah, you know, I just met you tonight. You're a nice guy. I'll tell you okay. what I'm going to do. I got these 10-year Swiss bonds over here. <laughs> and you could buy them from me. And when you cash them in in 10 years... I'm going to give you less money than you paid for them. <laughs> We're going to call it negative yields. You don't want the tenure. I got a five-year German bond. Same deal. You buy it today, I'll give you back less money in five years. This is unprecedented in world history. It never happened before. And the Federal Reserve is really the game player that's creating all of this. But, but for example, you look at who... Who the president of the uh, the European Central Bank is? Mario Draghi. Who did he work for? Oh, wasn't he the head of the European division of Goldman Sachs? And, and, and what is that guy's name that created this thing called Too Big to Fail? Oh, I remember him. Henry Paulson. I think he took over Boris Karloff movies and now he's playing Frankenstein. That guy? Oh, did he work for Goldman wasn't he the chairman of Goldman Sachs too? Oh, and what was the guy under Ray under Clinton that deregulated the banking industry and killed Glass Steagall? That was put in place following the crash of '29, so that this situation would never happen before, and the banks wouldn't be able to get all this power that they have. Oh, that was Robert Rubin. I think he was with Goldman Sachs too, wasn't he? So you can see the game here. It's all the money. It's yeah, it's all the, all the bankers. Yeah. That's all this is. It's a banking takeover. It's worldwide. And people don't want to recognize it for what it is. This is no longer capitalism. And that's not a conspiracy theory, because I could tell you four words killed it. You're an attorney that works in small businesses. They get in problems. Who bails them out? Actually, they bail themselves out. And if or they, they can't? Uh, they get crushed. But they not if you're a big guy. I got a word for you. A term. Too big to fail. Too big to fail killed capitalism. Well, that was AIG. AIG was too big yeah. to fail. And whoever knew of an AIG before? Right. But you know why we bailed out AIG? Because they were too big to fail. No. No, no that's what they told us. No. <laughs> Goldman Sachs gang had a $13 billion loss that we had to cover. Well, yeah, so we covered a marker. There that, yeah. you got a gambler. Exactly. Now, you know, what's interesting is, you know... In the law, we see some things um, that, I guess, gives us some insight into trends. And I remember during the, quote, housing boom before the big bubble crush, um, lawyers would be saying to me, like, I just came out of a closing. It was like 105% financing. I don't know how these people are going to pay their mortgage. It's interest only. And um, they're going to basically just ride it out for a couple of years, sell the house, flip it, live there for free, and it's going to, like, just doesn't make any sense. No. And, and I would listen to these things, and i go, who is behind this that, you know, 105%, 110% financing, uh, no money down, no income verification check, you know, and all, and, 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 and all these lawyers are saying, how could, they, how could these people be moving to a house that I can't afford, and I seem to be making more money than these people? And I'd be talking to people in the hallways, and I, and I don't know, I didn't think much of it. I said, this isn't going to last. That's the only yeah. thing I said. And boy, it didn't last. It came down hard. Again, it was something we had forecast. Actually, I took out the domain name in 2007, the Panic of 08. That's how sure I was. But people didn't want to hear it. And it's just like you said, it didn't make sense. Just like the, just like the dot-com crash. Yeah, you, you, you listening to these people talk about products and what they were doing and 
And I said, it doesn't add up. I can't figure it out. And they I'm were saying. selling things without money, you yeah. know, or it's like they would build a website and they'd be valued on something they weren't really selling for any money because they were giving everything away for free. Yeah. <laughs> so and you, so that was the same yeah. thing that happened. And by the way, you said there was, you know, it hasn't really recovered that much. You know, housing, new housing starts a half of what they were back when the boom days were going on. And the um, first-time homeowners, I think it accounted for something like 40 46% of all new purchases, people between the ages of like about 25 to 36. And now that's down to about 30%. They can't afford to buy new homes. The young people, they get lousy jobs. There's been really no... Oh, median household income is below 1999 levels. I believe that. That's a fact. And you know, when you talk to younger people... And you ask them, you know, what are they doing? Where are they living? The general answer is they're living at home or they're living like five or six yeah. people in a house for that, you know, or an apartment that really two people should be living in. Um, and they have kind of maybe part-time jobs or they're interning because they can't really find anything. And you look and you say, this is, th- if you project forward, um, you say, there's not a lot, this isn't a lot of good news out there. And I definitely see a lot of people leaving New York. I mean, I see people leaving left and right because the amount of regulation, taxes. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. And not, not to mention things like traffic and, you know, all these other issues. You know, I, I have people who are clients who want to build and expand businesses. And they say it's, it's either too tough to get real estate, too expensive to get real estate. Um, it's too problematic in terms of uh, regulation, this and that. Uh, to do anything? The regulations are problematic because the problem is they're only regulating the little people. That's right. That's right. When you're a big guy, you get all the breaks. I mean, one of the most disgusting things, I got my master's, by the way, in public administration, and there was no such thing. It was just starting to happen. Economic development agencies. You got a bunch of guys who don't know what they're doing that are doing, bringing in big corporations. Matter of fact, I read... I may be wrong on the number, but I don't think I am. Since 2014, in New York, they've given some $22 billion worth of tax breaks, loan guarantees, infrastructure repairs to major corporations to open up their businesses here. And when you look at the studies... Only the taxpayers pay for it. We never get back what they promise. You could go after study after study. So they give the big guys all the free breaks and all of our money. There's been a consolidation. Again, you're in the business of of helping small business owners uh, owners and representing them. Once upon a time, there used to be mom-and-pop shops. There were hardware stores. There were stationery stores. There were drug stores. Or now, candy stores, yeah. yeah. Yeah, now there are CVS and there are Walgreens. Now there are Staples, and now there's not even going to be uh, Office Depot because Staples is buying them out. I didn't even know that. Yeah, uh-huh. and and so it's a consolidation. There were no Targets. When we were a kid, what were there, three Macy's? One in Yonkers, one in Harrow Square, one out here, you know? <laughs> one in Manhasset, yeah. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was it. So you had mom-and-pop dress shops. You had into and you went to mom and pop tailors. Exactly. And you went to the shoemaker. Right. So I went to Al the shoemaker. Yes. So everything has been consolidated. What they did was they deregulated the laws that prevented this from happening: the Robinson Patman Act, the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act, and of course I mentioned before about Glass Steagall. So you don't have the opportunity anymore. There were no WalMarts. They were, no, well, no, no. You, 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 you. Klein's on the square. Yeah. <laughs> Corvettes. Yeah. EJ Corvettes. Eight Jewish, eight Jewish Korean veterans. I used to buy my, my vinyl records yeah. from them. Yes. And now Two ninety nine. If they were on sale, it was two ninety nine. If it was regular price, it was three ninety nine. Yeah. So what happened is they've taken the opportunity out of the land of opportunity. Because the politicians are basically, as I said, they like to use the term campaign contributions. Let's be adults about this. They're bribes and payoffs. I've been there. I know what it's like. And, and you know what, you know what the, the, the most disgusting part of it is? You could buy these guys off cheaply. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so, serious. So who says there isn't a deal out there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
That's how stupid the politicians are. No, you know, the problem of cheap money has been talked about in a lot of different, you know, off the radar kind of publications. But it's a problem because they said, you know, if you have virtually zero interest rate charges, what do you do to keep it going? You're going to have to like actually pay people, you know, like at some point. It, you can't go below zero. You, you know, you, uh, and you know, the interesting thing also you were talking about um, are when corporations do like reverse mergers um, where they'll buy a foreign company and merge out of the United States yep. for the taxes. Taxes, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Burger King. Burger King, that did with uh, Tim Hortons. Right. Right. Up in Canada. That's right, right, because they saved, I don't know, how many millions in taxes by doing that? Yeah, and, and you have Starbucks, Google, they're all doing it. Uh, uh, Microsoft, they're all, you know, they're in Ireland. They're all, you know, playing this game of, you know, not paying what we pay. So you're right. That's why all of the laws, what, what, what's actually happening is we're becoming a neo-feudal society. I'll give you an example. You have a political elite and an economic nobility. We just saw, for example, the LIBOR rates, which are the interest rates. We know it's a fact they were rigged. They were found, they committed felonies. They were convicted of felonies. And no one went to jail. No one went to jail. That's right. No one went to jail. No one Nobody. went to jail. That's right. The Forex market, the currency markets, $5.3 trillion a day. Rigged. Felonies. No one went to jail. Don't go over that yellow line. You had your brights on when you, somebody was approaching you. Uh, Three points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did uh, you have any drinks? Where'd you come from? Let me see your license of registration. Suspended. Yeah. 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 So it's a neo-feudal society because in neo-feudalism, what they do in the old feudal days, the nobility and the elites had different laws than we do. You know, it's funny you say that, and I don't want to interrupt, but no, it, no. I actually say, what's well, interesting is I, I fight... A lot of times the New York City Environmental Control Board or <clears throat> some administrative part of New York City, which all they do is issue fines all the time. And what I usually do is I usually bring a lot of procedural challenges back. You didn't serve it right. And you, my favorite is you didn't use a license process server. The process server didn't serve it right. And you're trying to stick us with a fine. And, I, and they kind of look at me like the judge or whatever. And then the, the other side, the city people are prosecuting. I say, look can't have two systems of justice. We can't have the sloppy one that it's okay for you to get away with and one that if we deviate by an inch, we're screwed. We can't have two systems of justice. But that's what we have. That's what we have. I'm telling you, we have that. Feudalism. But we have that right now in the law. I know. Because the little guy gets... You got it. Skavoich. <laughs> but the big guys, they won't bother. They'll never... They will never come down on the big guys unless it's horrendous. And even when it is horrendous... It's so big that, like, I remember the big problem was there was, you know, the Hudson River cleanup. You know, they said, oh, you know, either don't clean it up or this or that. And they ended up saying, oh, well, just, it was like pennies on the dollar. That was it. But if you have, like, an oil spill on your property because it was like a gas station or, you, God forbid, you bought a gas station property that's been abandoned for a long time, they will destroy you until you clean it up and make you spend four, five hundred, six million to clean it up. Because the small guy gets crushed. That's right. That's, that, like, like finally this ground. This has never been like this before. And that's what this book, by the way, in the movie's about, Zizzy and Honey Boy. <laughs> My Aunt Zizzy. Zizzy is the Neapolitan dialect for auntie. Z is aunt. Zizzy is your auntie. And honey, she used to call me Honey Boy. You know, she rests in peace. This is a book about what America used to be like. The opportunities that we had when family was family. I mean, that's the foundation of the book. And then, of course, it moves forward from there. All right, hold on. We're going to take a quick break. Richard <laughs> Solomon, Gerald Salente will continue right after this. Keep it locked in. We're actually here because of a movie. <laughs> you're, you're the main, you know, you may not be the main actor, but you're certainly the main star. So let's talk a little bit about the book that led to the movie, because you were talking about that before the break. Well, the book takes place, um, as I said, it's about growing up in, in the Bronx and Yonkers and what the Italian families used to be like. And, and, the, and the, 
and what the country used to be like. I mean, my Uncle Al, Zizzy's husband, may he rest in peace, he had a butcher shop in the Bronx on Williams Bridge Road. And they were able to afford a beautiful house in, in uh, Colonial Heights in Yonkers, you know, a beautiful house that today would probably be selling for about you know, $800,000 that they probably bought for 29000 you know. And so you had the opportunity to do that. And it was all of the opportunity. You mentioned my cousin Liz, Elizabeth de Libertori. Her mother and father, they were great too. Her mother, what a, oh, she was so funny. And I had a... I had an aunt Ida. <laughs> oh, she was great. They, they, she was from the Bronx too. <laughs> yeah. And, and they had a fish store in uh, Jackson Heights. And, you know, they lived in Corona. And we used to, I remember the, the neighbors, who were cousins, you know. They had this big yard and all the parties. And you could make it then. I remember all the construction companies from Corona. Because uh, Corona was like the heart of many Italian families who first and sec- second generations, you know, were little construction companies, you know, paving, you know, just, you know, little little stuff. But but they but they that's what they did. They they kinda came home from World War II. They built small businesses, they raised families, sent kids to college and they worked hard and basically, you know, it was okay. Yeah. And that's when the business of America was business. And now the business of America is war. Well, the business of America now is also, I call it three card Monty, because if you look oh, at yeah, all, well, that's you know, if you look at like real estate now, you know, people are treating real estate not as a place to live, but it's almost like an investment, but it's not because, the, you know, the idea that real estate is always going to go up and it's always going to go up at a certain rate. How, how Most people don't make enough money to afford the mortgages. So I don't know how that's going to go on forever. Well, again, it is the three card Monte because, of I mentioned, the, all this quantitative easing and 0% interest rates. So now you're even seeing the 30-year fix going over 4%. And so, I mean, I bought, I mentioned to you, I bought these buildings in uptown Kingston, Colonial Kingston, the stockade area. I, in 2012, I got a fixed at 2.85 for 15 years. Oh, that's a good deal. Yeah, so, I mean, it's unprecedented, and, and even at 4% is low. So it's going, it is, a, it's three-card Monty. So, but I'm saying the business of America is war also, because it, it, first we talked about, of course, the deregulations that have allowed all these mergers and acquisitions to put we the little people under their command, and how we have this neo-feudal society. Secondly, Every day, it's always war, more war, and how about some more war? And don't watch out for those terrorists. Al Qaeda wasn't good. Now we got ISIS, you know. And by the way, ISIS. This is an anti-Italian movement. Yeah, you're looking at me strange. How are we going to sell Italian ISIS? Ah, get it. <laughs> <But I'm laughs> <bum-bum>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's always another boogeyman. You know, it's it's always so they keep this fear and hysteria going, and when. The Chinese are buying up everywhere. Especially Manhattan. All over. One of our trends in the Trends Journal, top trends of 2014, China boomtown near you. It's happening around the world. Again, they're, they're in the business of business. America's in the business of war. And, and as long as we keep having that mentality, that's what's going to happen. And I mentioned to you earlier in our conversation before we went on the air, we're launching Occupy Peace on September 20th up in Kingston, and um, it's to bring home the troops, seal the borders, rebuild America, honor thy founding fathers, no foreign entanglements, force Congress to vote every time that we go into another country, which they have not done since World War II. They've given the president the power, but they haven't voted for war. And secondly, on each state referendum, we the people will tell our congressmen how to vote, just like what's going on now in Greece. They're having a referendum whether or not to go for the bailout. Because after all, when war comes around, we're the ones that pay for it with our money and our lives. You Blood don't and see, treasure. Yeah, you don't see any presidents or senators' sons, do you? That's a famous rock song from the 60s, right. Fortunate Son. So, but before we Go back conclude, to the book. Now, before we <laughs> conclude, what, you have a trends journal. Yes. Let's talk about that. What is it? How do you get it? What does it talk about? Well, we have it right over here. It's 54 pages, full color. Highest quality printing, going back to the old ways, of trends that are shaping the future, whether they're in energy and food. Artful aging, a big trend. Baby boomers are turning 70 next year. 
it's going to be the whole world is getting older and people aren't really hitting the pinnacle that they can but there's a lot of opportunity we do a lot in aging we have conferences up in Kingston people from all over the world come so you name the category we cover it economics geopolitics and we have the best of the best Nomi Prince just wrote this great book all the president's bankers she writes for us and she was just here for a conference she was here for the conference three days before she was a keynote speaker at the Federal Reserve speaking to the Federal Reserve the IMF and the World Bank wow yeah. wow so going back to the book, the Zizzy and Honey, and so anyway, you can get it on our website. It's trendsresearch.com. All right. And, and there's no other magazine like it, digital. I've read it, and I think it's awesome. Thank you. And, and so the book, by the way, begins also with what happened to me. I used to be on Oprah, the Today Show, Good Morning America. Man, USA Today used to run my top trends every year, and that's how the book actually begins, when they ran that trend in 2000, December 13th, 2000, and the headline read, 2001 won't be our year, Trendseer says. And I warned that a wave of anti Americanism would sweep the globe and Americans wouldn't be safe at home or abroad. This is certainly true today. It was several months before 9 11. And when I, everybody started calling me and asked us why they attacked us, that's how the movie begins. Right. And I wasn't buying the party line while everybody was tying yellow ribbons around things that didn't move and waving American flags. Matter of fact, we detail in the Trends Journal how President Bush, on the eve of 9-11, and I believe it was 11 or 9 days later when he addressed that nation, there was not one fact in his speech that warranted an attack against Afghanistan. Not one fact. And again, going to war, the longest war in American history that's still going on, and Obama promised to end it, now he's re-keeping the troops there longer than he said he was. So, again, the movie begins with me saying, this isn't the story. No, they, they didn't attack us because they hate our f freedom and liberty. I've been writing about this for years. They hate us because we keep propping up dictators that keep pushing their societies into poverty, raping their nations, and we're the, we're the, we're the enforcers for the crime bosses. And in Trends 2000, my Warner book, 1996, a national bestseller in 17 different languages, I wrote that you're waking up in the new millennium and Crusades 2000 is raging. That's all this is. It's the 10th Crusade. Wow. So let's talk about the movie real fast. You saw the movie? Oh, I love the movie. <laughs> what is it like to see yourself portrayed in a movie in which other people are acting and, and being you? It's got to be surreal and cool and bizarre all at the same time. Well, it is surreal and it is cool, but it wasn't bizarre at all <laughs> because uh, Andrew Koss did a great job I of, of me... 15 years ago. I'm a very different guy than I was 15 years. I'm not a, I'm different different but different in the sense that what I went through for speaking about as a trend forecaster what would happen in Afghanistan? What would happen in Iraq? What would happen with the real estate markets? And how my career was almost destroyed. So watching the movie the first time, and I was watching with our CEO, his name is Derek Osinenko, who was also the editor-in-chief of Gannett News Service. I know Gannett. I've heard of him. Yeah, you've heard of him. So he was the top guy. So we're watching, and I'm just telling you, tears just rolled down my eyes, you know, reliving it. So they did a great job. They did a great job with it. Uh, so anyway, for the people who are, who are listening, we're actually at the uh, North Shore Towers because we have a whole soiree tonight. Uh, we're going to be watching the movie. We're going to have all the people who are involved. I, I actually had a little contribution. I was one of the legal people. <laughs> ah, great. Thank you. Thank you. So I was one of the legal people behind the scenes. Guy. When, at the end of the movie, um, I, I see my name. I'm like, woo! <laughs> That's kind of a neat little thing. Um, I think this movie has great potential, more than just a movie. Because, you know, every night, part of the Trends Journal, we do trends in the news, the real news. Not the stuff that you're getting, you know, about... I mean, the Infotainment like, news? Infotainment. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like... Again, you know, I was talking about a neo... neo uh, feudalism. Neo-feudalism society. And um, when the information came out that the banks were convicted of, of uh, felonies... It hardly made the papers. But then a week later, to the date, there was this thing about FIFRA that nobody ever heard of with the, with the scandal in, in soccer. 
that was all over the news. So what they do is they know that people are into sports, so they divert the attention. Who cares about what happened? Well, that's why a lot of important legal decisions come out Fridays at 5 o'clock on a three-day weekend, or some kind of ruling or law comes out. And, of course, it also comes out on the weekend where, like, the Queen has a royal jubilee or there's the, the Belmont Stakes or something so that the real highlighted news overtakes anything else and it's kind of a blurb somewhere and some people read it on the internet and it's a ho hum moment and of course the news cycle's over because we have very tight news cycles so by Monday we're already on to the next thing whatever that thing is you yes. see that's your trend forecaster because that's <laughs> what we talk about we talk about that that what they, exactly what you said I mentioned Derek Osinenko so he's working in Arlington Virginia you know the headquarters of Gannett and he said by Friday, you know, 11 o'clock, everybody's out of there. You know, they did, they're working hard all week long. So what they do, the government, they wait until later in the day on Friday to release information because Saturday is the least read newspaper of the week. That's right. You know, it's like, it was a new day yesterday, but it's an old day now. Yeah, <laughs> well put. That's a song by Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. Well, if you ever need a, a, a amateur, you know, legal trends guy, let me know and I'll put my, you know, I'll put my elbow grease into the, right. into the big machine. I really appreciate your time. I, I love the movie. I read the book, so I'm a true fan. Oh, thank and, you. and I actually thank do read the Trends Journal, so thank in many you. ways, um, I'm meeting my hero. Oh, so it's okay. very, very nice. Oh, so yeah. I appreciate thank the time. Thank you. I have tremendous respect and admiration for you. Good luck with all the future uh, political atheism. It sounds more like you're trying to do an awakening <laughs> of, well, the, you know, of the American spirit. The, the motto, it, we are. The motto of the Trends Journal is think for yourself. And that was taught to me by my father. Uh, his, yeah. Very Buddhist, because Buddha said as he was dying, be a light unto yourself. So in many ways, that's, that's, you're, you're giving timeless advice, much like Zissi. That's right. Yeah, right? Yeah. right. And that's respecting the elders. There again, you go. In which I do Ancient every day. wisdom. Yeah. Yep. And they didn't get there without a few hard days. You know, all I think of myself is just a piece of their DNA. So I thank them for my being, my breath, my bones, my brains, my body. I thank the ancestors every right. day. All right. And to that, we give them a toast. All right. Salud. Thank you. All right. Rich Solomon signing off for now. See you next week. And it's Gerald Salente. And what's the website? Trendsresearch.com. Trendsresearch.com. So that's our show. Now we come to the special bonus feature where we interview the person who donated the main part of the movie's uh, scenery, which is the, the Zizzy's house. So take a listen. It's, it's really funny. Okay. Your name is? It's Terry Messina. Now, I think they mentioned you in the, in the big room out there. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes. Okay. So wait, you, you had a big, a really big, I, I, I mean, I had a little contribution. Like like, I had like a five-second contribution. But you had a big contribution. You provide the, the set, essentially. Yes, the house where they, okay. where they filmed it. Okay. If we go to the house today, is there a plaque? <laughs> No plaque. Right. Just the, so how did you how did you find out that you were going to be the provider the provider of the house? Let me see. My um, I was at work and my sister called and said, um, "How would you would you mind if somebody um, used one of your rooms for um, a film?" So I said I was at work, so I was busy. I said, "Sure, sure. They can use one of my rooms for a for a film." And I hung up the phone and then. I started to think about it and I said, oh my God, oh, they want to use one room? And I was thinking I have one room with like this super king platform, king size bed. And I'm saying, oh, they want to use it for a porn film. <laughs> I said, oh no, no, let me call my sister back. I call my sister and I say, Mary, do they want, do they want to use it for a porn? And she said, she started to get hysterical on the phone. And she said, no, silly, it's for Liz. And she's making a film about an aunt and a little boy. And I, she says, I don't know, but it's nothing to do with porn. I said, oh, all right, if they just want to use one. And she said, and I don't think it's the bedroom they want to use, like the kitchen and the living room dining area. I said, oh, all right, okay. And that was how I got involved with the film. So how long were you homeless? <laughs> <laughs> For a weekend, a long weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They left at 1 a.m., on Monday morning, and actually the uh, 
the truck driver called from the road saying that he was stuck and he didn't know what to do and could he come back and would I mind if he slept over that night? And of course I said yes. So you get to meet Doris Roberts? Yes, oh my goodness. What, what was she like? She was fantabulous, just fantabulous, kind and generous and answered questions and invited people over for lunch. At your house? <laughs> yeah, yes, at my house, yes. That's kind of funny. Do you have any pictures of you and her? Yes, I do. Oh, see, that, that, that must be a great story. Yes, yes, I do. So, so what, did, what was it like to watch the production from your point of view? Well, I had no idea that it took like 40 people to make this small short film. And it was really fascinating. It was fascinating. I loved it. Now, what was it like to see the personal view of the movie being made with the naked eye as opposed to sitting in a movie theater and seeing the finished product? It just goes to show you the, the great artistry that goes into making a film because Dominic did an absolutely fantabulous job. I would have never thought that that, what I saw, the little bits and pieces that I saw would be put together into this really very moving and touching film. Now, did you know anything about the movie when they were making it at your house? Oh, I'd read the book before. I had... Okay, just to make sure there's no dirty scenes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just to, you know, just to, just to make, just to double check. It was not going to be any porn in the house. Yeah. So, so now, now you have to either put up like a little plaque or a time capsule or something, you know, in the backyard or whatever. Um, how much did they have to modify your house to accommodate the, the historical element that it was not taking place today? It was just uh, the art committee was the art group was just, um, they, they, um, they did a lot of work prior to the film and when they came to the house, they were measuring, taking pictures. I mean, I have a, um, you know, an electric electric stove top and if you look on the film you'd see there's an old fashioned stove on the top they I don't know how they if they actually they covered over that and they they covered over the refrigerator and they they made modifications the phone of course if you see the phone I love the the rotary phone yeah. the reason why I asked you in pre-production if that was your phone or not because I, I have an old rotary phone in an attic somewhere I don't yeah, you know but, but that's you know, that's what I guess you know. Prop departments are all about. Yeah. And they picked up um, a, a, a Victrola, an old Victrola, and you know, but, and they used my mother's old lamps in the film. You know, like it was just, it was very, it was really fascinating. So when you see the movie and you see your home, you know, there, what do you, what, what do you feel like? I said, oh my goodness, it looks quite lovely there. <laughs> I mean, it looks just it made my my little home is now a star. So, so one of the questions I always ask interviewees, like, you know, what's your next book? What's your next movie? So what's what's going to happen to the house? Is the house going to be used in another feature movie? <laughs> I don't think so. Never again. <laughs> and, and now, are you are you now the most famous house in Glen Cove? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that. There's a lot of other very famous homes in Glen Cove. Oh, uh, uh, I appreciate your contribution. I, I guess we're, we're part of the same team. So thank you for... Uh, doing what you did and had, had I had the opportunity I was actually invited to be on the set but I had litigation going on but next movie I'll, I'll be there okay good I hope to see you there alright thanks again